Thank you for choosing Supli Church Online and taking some time out of your day to be with us. We welcome you to worship this Sunday or whenever you are watching this video. Uh, be sure to give us a like or a share and ultimately we would love to hear from you, whether it's via social media, email, or a phone call. Before we get going, I have a couple very brief announcements for you this morning. First, I would like to remind you that Mondays at 11 a.m., there is a time of pastoral prayer and care via Zoom, and all are welcome and encouraged to join. Next, Supli Church, we would, we would like to send our condolences to the family of Marty Peterson, who passed away earlier this week. And lastly, the church has a new website that we're going to give you a closer look at in just a few moments. Hey, Spooly Church, it's Evan here. Just want to draw your attention to the fact that we launched a new website this past week. So if you have a couple moments, take some time, click it through, and just check it out. While I have you, I want to draw your attention to three pages quickly. So up here at the top, if you're on a computer, you'll see this bar up here. If at any time you should need to watch a service, maybe you missed it or maybe you want to rewatch it because you enjoyed it so much, just go to the services button and you will see all of Supli's services that we have put online. Also, if at any time you're wondering about the mission and the mission of the month and those things, we've added a missions tab. It's right here next to services. And then last, I want to draw your attention all the way at the end is our calendar tab. So when Supli Church does resume and is having events, whenever that is, you'll be able to see and see a very updated calendar through our calendar tab. If you're looking at the website and you're on a mobile phone or something like that, instead of this bar, you will see three lines. Just tap on those and then the menu will come up and it'll be the same thing. Thanks guys, I hope you enjoy the website. Now I would like to begin this morning's call to worship from Luke chapter one. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of God's tender mercy. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Please pray with me this morning. Lord, I just want to take a moment and pray for everyone who is hurting right now. Pray for everyone with emotions that they have unsure of where to go or what to do with them. And we want to pray for the confusion. Lord, 2020 is this year that is just wrought with challenges and uncertainty and new. And we know, Lord, that you know the way to go. And we ask that you would show it to us. We ask that you would comfort us and you would lead us through this time of worship and in our daily lives. We ask now before we say the Lord's Prayer again, God, on earth would it be as it is in heaven. And now together as a body of believers, we recite the entire prayer together saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. There's a song that popped in my head this week from when I was a little girl, and it went like this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now this week, you may have seen some things on your TV, or maybe you heard your parents talking about all the fighting that's been going on in our country and in our towns. And I imagine that you think adults know everything, but sometimes as smart as those big people are, they forget that Jesus loves us all. Jesus knows that we are all the same inside, no matter what we look like on the outside. Some of us are short, some of us are tall, we all have different colored hair, eyes, and skin, but Jesus died on the cross for all of us, no matter what we look like. I wanted to show you these two strings I have, and you can see here that they're different. One is longer, one has red on it, maybe you can see that. They're different just like you and I, but we all serve one God, and that unites us, just like these strings are united to be one. We're all united in the Lord Jesus and in his love for us. So I pray this week that you will love on your friends, love on your family, no matter where they're from or what they look like. We're all one with our Lord. Have a great week. There are three scripture excerpts for this service. If you are reading along, the first one is Psalm chapter 60, verses 1 through 12. Then we're going to go and we're going to read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, verse 6, 15, and 23. After that, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and read verses 6 through 9, and then also verse 16. And here is Psalm 60, verses 1 through 12. O oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry now. Restore us. You have caused the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair the cracks in it, for it is tottering. You have made your people suffer hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us real. You have set up a banner for those who fear you to rally to, to it out of bowshot, Selah. Give victory with your right hand and answer us. 
so that those whom you love may be rescued. God has promised in his sanctuary with exaltation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the vale of Succoth. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. On Edom I hurl my shoe. Over Philista I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Adam? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe. For human help is worthless. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Turning now to John 14. And again, if you're reading along, it's John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, then verse 6, 15, and 23. Verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then verse 23, Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Our last excerpt is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then this one is going to be verses 6 through 9, and then verse 16. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. In verse 16, From now on, therefore, we, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. May God bless the reading of his word. As we gather around the Lord's table today, let us also gather around his word that we might learn from the Lord those things that would be advantageous for our daily living. Let's pray together. Lord, cause us to be open to what you have to say to us. Pour down your spirit upon us and enable us to worship you in honor and glory today. Amen. Jane left home and fell into difficult and hard relationships, and she began to misuse the gifts that she had been given in life. Soon, she did not open any of, the father's, any of her father's letters because she had come to the place where she was estranged from him. Jane's aunt, Maggie, wrote a letter to her. It was a powerful letter, and it had great depth, and it made a change in her life. The words went like this. Jane, you need to come home again for your sake. You need to come home for your daddy's sake because your daddy is hurting. And Jane, you need to come home for the Lord's sake. Now that was taken from a clip from John Lloyd Ogilvy and his book entitled The Cup of Wonder. That's a plea of great love, isn't it? The invitation to the Lord's Supper that we're going to experience today is also an invitation to great love, mindful of that old hymn, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling us all to come home, calling for you and for me. Coming home is usually a very positive thing for most people. When you come home, there's usually a sense of anticipation, a sense of welcome, and a sense of wonder. And sometimes, if you play your cards right, someone will either do your laundry for you or help you with it. If you speak to most college students, they will tell you that they love the idea that they are out on their own and taking on life's challenges. But they also tell you, if they're honest, that they also enjoy being at home, not only for the help with the laundry, 
but for the love and the care that comes their way. Now the term that John used for house is also used for the term mansion. And so you will remember Jesus said to his disciples, in my father's house are many mansions. If, they're not, if that were not so, would I have told you that I go and make a place for you? Jesus is talking about a home, about a mansion that is big enough for all of his followers to fit in, a place which will prepare us for our eternal home. And so in the meantime, while Jesus goes off to be with his father to prepare that eternal home, he says to his disciples, in the meantime, my father and I will make our home in you. And perhaps that helps us to understand communion in an important way. That communion is a celebration of the meantime. That is that time before we go to our eternal rest with the Lord. The words of Jesus in the 14th chapter of John's gospel are words of wonder and astonishment. And although Jesus' disciples spent three years with him, they still didn't know him, not really know him. And so in the Passover that was to come, Jesus was going to make a disclosure as to who he was, as to what he was going to do. And the disciples were going to get a greater glimpse of the one they had spent years with. Just as Jesus' words in the 14th chapter of John's gospel rattled Thomas and the other disciples. Nevertheless, Jesus got them thinking about things when he talked about the bread and the wine of communion. And it should do the very same thing for us. Today, as we come to the Lord's table, we should turn our spirit to the Lord and break through our reserved natures and blast through the walls of resistance that sometimes we engage in and keep us away from totally connecting with the Lord at his table. And so I hope to share with you a powerful disclosure that speaks to what we're going to celebrate in just a few moments from now. And it actually comes to us from the Old Testament, from the Psalms and particularly Psalm 60. And something that we need to think about as we gather around the Lord's table. A look at Psalm 60 reveals that the psalmist had gone through a series of emotional calamities. So too did the nation. And it took him out of his slumber and complacency to pay attention to the tragedies and the things that were happening around him. He was not simplistic in his view of these things, but he realized indeed that the nation was in trouble and the Lord was trying to speak to him and to his people. And so he knew that God was in charge. He realized that he had to depend on God and he couldn't cop out and say, well, it's the fault of this one. It's the fault of that one. It's not my fault. Instead, he listened to what God had to say to his people, how that could become a learning experience for him. And indeed it was. And this Psalm shows us three particular themes, themes or ways in which God speaks to us through the Psalms and ultimately speaks to our gathering around his table. These three themes are the following, God's judgment, first of all, God's intervention, and then God's ultimate victory for his people. These are themes that are apparent in the Psalms, but they should all be apparent to us as we gather around the table that we need to think about communion being indeed a time of God's judgment, a time of God's intervention, and also a reminder of God's ultimate victory for us in Jesus Christ. How often we have heard these words, all those who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered of the burden of them are invited to his meal. And yet how often do they go in one ear and out the other? The psalmist had no choice but to deal with these themes that we see here in Psalm 60 that speak to us about God's intervention and power. It really does startle us when we truly confront how seriously God takes sin, how seriously God takes our rebellion or our self-justification. It is what we witnessed in the looting and the destruction that took place this week. It is what we witnessed in the uh, killing of an innocent person and now other lives taken as a result of what is going on in our cities. And all of those things 
the looting and the inappropriate things that people do to one another, they all build up. They all build up and eventually they come to the place where we become separated from God and we become confused in our daily lives. And when we catch a vision of what God intended life to be, dependent upon him, surrendered to him, then we can be filled with his spirit. Then we can focus on the nature of sin because we've taken it seriously, we've looked at it inwardly, we've looked at it from the perspective at how it affects us as well as others. And it is only when we open ourselves up to the Lord that we begin to understand what it means when we talk about his unlimited grace in our lives. It therefore takes something as astonishing as a blast out of our complacency, a blast out of our disobedience to wake us up. And Jesus does that for his people too when he gathers them in the upper room at the Lord's Supper. For both his body and his blood would become emblematic of what he would do on the cross for each one of us. Just as the psalmist calls out for the intervention of God, realizing that Gilead, Manasseh, Judah, all belong to him, he seeks God's intervention in the lives of his people. And God is more than prepared to give it. So when we come to the table with that knowledge that because Jesus was willing to intervene our, on our behalf, that we are his as well, just like the lands in the Old Testament belong to God. So in the act of breaking the bread and drinking the cup, Jesus is caring for us and Jesus is intervening for us on our behalf. And it's a foreshadowing of the love that would ultimately be poured out on the cross of Calvary. So let me ask you, what do you think? What are the thoughts that you normally have when you come to the Lord's table? Do you make the transition in your mind that this loaf of bread or this matzah or that this juice is really emblematic of more than just substances on the table, that it is emblematic of the power of God and that the real blood of Christ was going to be spilled and that the real body of Christ was going to be broken, broken for your sin and for mine. It's important and it's crucial that when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we really understand what it is that we are doing and that we are remembering that it was the love of God and the power of God and the willingness of God that makes us whole once again. And so as we gather here and we share in this meal together, realize that the implications are far beyond this little circle that is gathered as the Plea Presbyterian Church, but that the very power of God and the very love of God is now in us. The psalmist was astonished that after all and that he and his people had gone through, that God would still welcome them, that God would still care for them. Listen to what the psalmist says. But for those who fear you, who have raised a banner, that those you love may be delivered. The fact is that God loves us in spite of all that we do. That's the message that we ought to take away from the table today. If we don't have that kind of focus when we come to the communion table, we are like people taking pictures of the burning bush from angles because we don't want to get too close. But the joy of communion is that God welcomes us to take off our sandals and to come all the way to that burning bush and to realize that when we come to communion, we are on holy ground at the Lord's table. Sometimes we think about the fact that all the aprons are clean and everything is fastidiously set up and pleasing to the eye, but there's also a burning bush on the table which needs to be addressed, which needs to be consumed. And so we need to take off our sandals. We need to take off those things that would separate us from God, those things that are in our hearts and our minds that shouldn't be, so that we might understand the power of God's love and God's forgiveness for us. We are the Lord's own children and it means forgiveness and a new beginning and it's only a repentant prayer away. And that's the third aspect that the psalmist mentions, God's ultimate victory. And it will take place for his people. We need to experience that as we get ga gathered around uh, the table that we are part of a new covenant 
Jesus lifted the cup and said, this is a new covenant. You are the new covenant people, which means that now the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Christ is in us. It is now in the hearts of men and women, transforming lives. There's power in this bread, not the bread itself. There's power in the cup, not the cup itself, but power is in the Christ who held the cup in his hand before his disciples. And so this morning, as we sit around the table, let us realize that there are children whose relationships with their parents are not all that they should be, and they require some healing. And there are certainly relationships within our nation that require healing as well. Lloyd John Ogilvie also gives another important example that speaks to our coming to communion this morning. He shares this about the power of the risen Christ. A man came to my office who had been away from home for three weeks. He felt that he couldn't go home because of the things he had said and done. After we talked for a long time, I called his wife and asked, Fran, would you like your husband to come home? She answered, on what terms? I talked to her about her judgments, her wounded feelings, her husband. When he picked up the telephone several minutes later, he heard something which sounded much like Maggie's advice to, June, to Jane. John, come home. Come home for the children. Come home for my sake. Come home because God loves you. And he put down the phone right in front of me and said, I am coming home. When the sailors put Admiral Nelson's body into the cathedral, it had a beautiful Union Jack on it as they lifted it up high into the cathedral altar. And then ultimately, when they took him to the graveside, they lowered the, the casket down. And as they began to do that, what happened was the soldiers all took a piece from the Union Jack and ripped it off and put it in their pockets. And then they said, now I've got a piece of him. I'll never forget him. Jesus anticipated our need for this sacramental identification in the broken bread and the spilled cup. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That is the most magnificent invitation that we can have in our lives. So when we come to the table today, help us to realize how much God loves us and is willing to overlook because of the sacrifice that his son endured on our behalf. Amen. All is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. To the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made up When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless words No one could express How much you Is 
is not what you have required You search much deeper within To the way things appear You're looking into my Welcome to communion this morning. And to begin with, I want you to think about what it would be like for us if we realized constantly that Jesus was watching not only what we're doing, but what is happening in his world. That people like George Floyd have been killed. Innocent people have been having their lives taken because of greed, because of racism, because of all sorts of things that transpire in the human heart and in the human mind. We look at the world in which we live and we see people being disobedient. They crowd together when they're told that's not the best thing for them to do. They loot stores, they take things that don't belong to them when it's not something that they should do. The example I think of is the one that someone told me about the other day that She was in the grocery store and found herself being yelled at because she wasn't standing on the right block or the right piece of tile. And so we have allowed some of the things that have taken place to take away any sense of kindness, any sense of goodness, any sense of sharing with others. We have become self-serving. And Jesus, I think, in looking at what is going on in our world, would say, enough is enough. When are you going to practice what I have taught you? That first and foremost, you are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we do that by doing kind acts. Jesus would say, enough is enough. My children, it is the cross that is the answer to all your problems. And that's where you need to head. How often do we forget to be kind or to practice the kindness of Jesus? And so our testimony, our witness, is blunted by our lack of a proper response. Take the message of this table. It's all about compassion. It's all about kindness. It's all about sacrificing. And it's all about Jesus. And he says, I want you to follow in my example. So let me ask you, when was the last time that you were kind to someone else? I don't mean just opening the door for someone, but truly kind putting yourself out there for someone else? When was the last time that you complimented someone for something that they did? Even though it may not have been necessary, even though it may not have been something that had ultimate importance to it. And when was the last time that you came alongside someone who was hurting? Because you see, these little aspects of ministry eventually build up and find us in the position that we're in now as a nation. And so it's important for us as we come to the table this morning to know that we are not alone in our frustration and we are not alone in the fact that we need the Spirit of God guiding and directing our paths. And so as we come to the table this morning, we realize that it is our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, who goes before us. And so that on the night in which he was betrayed after giving thanks, our Savior took bread and he broke it and he gave it unto his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he would take the cup saying, this cup 
is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it often in remembrance of me, for as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we do show the Lord's death until he should come again. And so let us share in the bread together. I presume you have prepared yours at home. So whether it is bread or matzah, let us share in that together as we remember the Lord. And then Jesus invited them to a new and everlasting covenant, which was not going to be based on the law, but was going to be based strictly on God's grace toward us in Jesus Christ. And so I invite you now to get the cup and share in it together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will guide and direct your people. We find ourselves at more than a low point. We mind our, find ourselves at a dev devastating place as your people. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you will help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those who need to experience the love of Christ in their lives, because that is the only real solution to all that is going on. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that we'll take what we've learned while we've been together around this table and apply it to those that we meet and to those that we see in the week ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now may the love of God abound and abide in you and your loved ones. And may you depend totally on the Lord. In doing so, you will be able to experience great things and great accomplishments as you work together to build this kingdom. Amen. Come to the table